Kian on, and I, I guess I'd call myself a shopkeeper of sorts. Uh, this is my new shop called Restory, and I opened it last December. I opened this shop in that Christmas window, that one month that shops opened up again. So it was actually perfect timing because this shop, I had been working on it during the first lockdown, and then <clears throat> October there was another lockdown <clears throat> and then things opened back up December so I had one month running up to Christmas to open the shop um, people really liked it and um, I sold stuff so So my idea comes from the Brown Thomas windows during Christmas. Like I remember being a kid and during Christmas there was like a nutcracker scene with a guy with a hammer in the window. And like, I was like, oh, I could make this shop similar to that. It won't be open, it's an enclosed space. So I, I can't obviously have customers in the shop. So the way I've positioned myself to keep myself open and within the rules is to have the windows open so people can see in and then there's a barricade at the front so when they're passing through they can just get a look in the door and I can have a chat and tell them who I am and what I'm about so it's actually worked for me like um, and also I've you know some jams for sale by Teresa who was a stall trade she was a stall holder here in the market but they had to take out a lot of stalls and unfortunately she was one of the traders who is out of business now, unfortunately. So I've given her a bit of retail space and along with other artists and creatives and craftspeople, new and established. Um, and then I make uh, some stuff myself as well. Hello everybody, welcome along to this politics program with me, uh, Tony Brown. And tonight I will be talking to, um, I suppose, the first person to put his name forward for the mayoralty of Limerick, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, I'd like to welcome along Finan Coughlin. Finan, you're welcome along anyway to this program. Tony, thanks very much for having me. It's my first time on Lear. So I'm oh, excited. Yeah. media, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll talk tonight about, um, first of all, about who you are and, and uh, where you come from and all that kind of stuff. And then we'll talk about the, the mayoralty. First of all, Finan, um, where are you from? Well, I'm from Corbley. So I actually grew up in uh, Westbury. So technically outside the Limerick border, just on the border there by uh, Shannon Banks. I went to St. Munchen's College. So I'm I'm uh, exempt from the curse of Saint Munchen. Are you in County Clare, so? County Clare, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but, uh, but, uh, and you put your name forward to go for this new, uh, I suppose, give it a smart a smart answer would be the the mayor's job, as we know this new this new system that they hope the, the the corporation was supposed to bring in, as you said, the council was supposed to bring in this year, but that has been put off now to next year. So you put yes, your well, name it's, on. Why? Well, it's going to be different from the traditional robe-wearing, chain-wearing mayor that we are used to, because up until now, our mayors have only served one-year terms, and the people haven't been able to actually elect the mayor. 
it's been chosen, it's been voted by the councillors themselves elect the mayor. Um, so there's 40 councillors and they each year elect a mayor um, to represent them. So now we'll have this new directly elected mayor, which will mean that not only will the people be able to elect someone to be the mayor of Limerick City and County Council, that individual who is elected will be given for the first time ever in Irish political history, executive powers. Up until now, all executive powers really have been in the hands of the civil service. Um, so this is a massive historic moment. And I announced my candidacy, candidacy last March. Now, do you think that, um, that, that the mayor, first of all, I personally think that the amount of money they're giving is wrong in one sense, because it could bring in a lot of people now just, just for the sake of the money, you know, that to me, you'd have to have a love of the city. And uh, it's, uh, it's somebody, a kind of a spokesperson, really, whereas the mayors that we know over the years have been all a political, a political appointees, really, which I always felt myself was wrong anyway. It shouldn't have been, you know, and because when you know in the 1820s, there, there were 40 councillors, we believe, city councillors. And they were always known as Alibaba and the 40 teams, you know. And then, of course, the Reform Corporation came in and put an end to that for a while. But still, the whole system, I always personally felt was wrong. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. And uh, I've been, I wasn't there to witness it, but I read this book, which I highly recommend, about how the local authority management system was brought in back uh, in the midst of the civil war and mm. this was the first ever um local authority manager in ireland and his name was philip monaghan so that's a book by a quinlevin a uh, lecturer political he specializes in local government and he wrote he um he wrote this book and it's absolutely brilliant because it really blows the lid on the whole charade uh, of local government because as you said alibaba and the 40 thieves people have completely lost faith in their government and for good reason for good reason because yeah. all the real power is not with the county councillors nor is it even with the ministers it's actually with the unelected government the civil senior civil servants and in the case of our local authority here in Limerick the chief executive and his board of directors the councillors you know have reserved functions but all real executive function lies with the chief executive and his board of directors. So this directly elected mayor has got them shivering in their shorts. They're really, really scared of this because this is the first time that the people of Ireland are actually going to be given real power. Not the people, well, we'll see if it, the people of Ireland would be given it too, but for now it's just the people of Limerick. And that's why I'm shocked to see so many people um, questioning the direct elected mayor when this is literally giving power from the unelected civil service back to the people of Limerick. I think this is something to be positive about, do you know? I, I wonder though myself, is the is the, 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 the council, not the council, is the government, are they going to allow this, I wonder? No. Is that's, why it, that's why it's being stalled. So you asked yeah. earlier, why is yeah. it being pushed back? That's why it's being pushed back. They're, they don't want this. They, Dublin would rather hold on to the power that they have already. They don't want to concede any power and give it down to the people of Limerick. So they're yeah. trying to stall the ball on this. Seems I had an interview with the, with the current mayor lately and that he's, he's blaming COVID. COVID is a great cover cover for delaying things, you know, yeah. which as we know everybody, life didn't stop because of COVID, you know, it still went down and people walked from home and that. But they have a great excuse that I, I really thought that, that the last mayor was to finish it, you know, and I have a fear, will there be another mayor elected next June? You know, you'd wonder what's going to happen. Because well, there, seem, there seem to be no kind of um, strict rules on them to finish it at a certain date. Well, it, in fairness, it is a kind of revolutionary reform because this is going to completely change local government and it's going to completely change national government. And if Limerick can pull this off, Limerick is really the guinea pig. We are the guinea pig in Limerick. The force, yeah. So, so if we have yeah. a big opportunity, but also a risk, we can't make a fool of ourselves because the rest of the country 
depends upon Limerick to actually get this right. Because if we get it wrong, they might scrap the entire idea of having a directly elected mayor for anyone. So I really think the people of Limerick need to sit down, take a look at, look at this and see the opportunity for us to actually take back our power from the civil service who seem to be completely untouchable. They do whatever they want and uh, they earn far more than the T-shirt does, some of them. So there's big question marks over the senior civil servants up in Dublin and they don't like the sound of this direct elected mayor. They would rather it never happened at all. But we in 2019 voted yes to the direct elected mayor, even though Cork and Waterford voted no. Mm-hmm. And Limerick voted yes. So let's let's take this opportunity. Uh, as of now, I'm the only person in the race. And uh, I don't know, I think it's kind of suspicious if you ask me what, why, where. You wonder, uh, I personally think, I mean, what your view on this is, but I think there should be nobody allowed to run that has political connections. That's one thing I, I object to. Because for years and years, we've ended up with, I mean, even in Limerick, they had this thing called a pact, which I think was disgusting, really, that you'd know who was going to be mayor before the election was ever had. I, re- I went to several elections, I down to the, the, the mayor, the elected mayor, and I know about a month in advance who was going to be mayor. And then this charade of supposed to be electing somebody, how do you vote? I vote, I vote, you know. And the same thing, if, the only exception was one year, Jim Kemi at least was mayor for a great year in 1990 which was a great year for him to be, to be mayor. But like that, Kemi was, was, was kind of too honest, really. But at least he, he got a crack at the whip of being mayor because Jim had, had a love for the city. We all know that. And uh, things he'd done for the city. But then we've had mayors. So I remember, I'm, I hate admitting I'm older than you. And we've had some, we had some mayors that they really hadn't a clue what they were doing. You know, they really had all of a good for going to functions and making big speeches that they weren't even writing. You know, there were certain mayors I remember, and they had writers, people writing the speeches for them. You know, and the whole thing was disgusting. Well, I don't pay too much attention to what the mayors are doing because I'm more interested in what the chief executive or the city manager is doing. You know, because at the end of the day, I think when this directly elected mayor is brought in eventually, I think we should actually maintain the ceremonial mayor, the mayors who wear the red robes and the chains and cut the ribbons, because at the end of the day, the ceremony is actually still an important part of local government. Someone needs to cut the ribbon. Someone needs to shake the hand and take the photo. But when it comes down to housing, transport, water, health services, education, rates, commercial rates, all of the real um, items of business, that's the chief executive's job, the city manager, the county manager, whatever you want to call them. So I think that the only uh, job being um, removed or altered should be actually the city manager. So I think that Daniel Butler, who is the current mayor, Daniel's a nice guy. I have nothing against any of the county councillors. My concern is with the chief executive and the board of directors. And if you walk down O'Connell Street today and you uh, ask people, who is the city boss of the council. No one has ever heard of Con Murray. No one has ever heard of Pat Daly. Yet these people have complete control. You know, which is the garden thing. You know, these people have been highly paid. We all know that, unfortunately, you know. And there's nothing you can do about it. And they're not even elected, most of them, you know. Which is, uh, well, most of them, the whole lot of them are not elected. And it's it's wrong. But, like, people don't know. It gets back then to the councillors. Have the councillors got... I thought this mayor was not to have anything got to do with the running of the city as such. I thought. No, no. This mayor will have executive functions. So they will have power over the budget, how the budget is drafted, where funding... Because the our local authority gets a certain amount of funding from national government each year. And... You know, we'll be given the autonomy to decide where that funding is spent. Um, for example, there was recent controversy over a prism, a Newton's prism being erected on Thomas Street for 500,000 euros. And people are asking, look, we've got a health crisis. We've got a housing crisis. We need to be pumping resources into those areas instead of spending it on things that we don't actually need at all. 
I know. agree with you there. There's so many things that uh, people often I have one or two counselors on about a, a, a life rail system for him. You know, <laughs> where's the money going to come from? You know, I even know that myself. There's some of the crazy things you hear coming up that uh, councillors have suggested over the years. Count, city council. That's another thing then as well. How would you think that you, if you were elected mayor, how would you control the county? Like in places, we forget how big the county is. Limerick is badly situated in the sense that if you go two miles out, out north, you end up in County Clare. Go, to, go about four miles west, uh, east and you end up in County Tipperary. So the city, and then you have to go 40 odd miles to be on, on to Abbey Fee and at the Fields Bridge. So how do you think that you would control let's suppose spending on that for some of the county towns that are kind of reckon rule really? Well, I wouldn't use the word control. I'd be more interested in seeing how I can actually empower the county, how I can empower the communities of Rat, Keel, Adair, Brough, Askeaton, Newcastle West, mm -hmm. wherever it happens to be, Abbey Field. You know, there are great people on the ground in those communities already. They have no interest in political, you know, gossip. All they want to do is, you know, help out their community, whether it's a playground, whether it's looking after the local river or whatever it happens to be. My main focus would be to take powers from the unelected chief executive and start giving those powers back to the communities. And how would you do that? Well, we've started this public participation network, which is the PPN. So if you have a community council, let's say your Brough Tidy Towns or your Brough Community Council, because you have that little group, you can then become part of the PPN. And if you're on the PPN, you can become, you can elect someone in your group to um, represent you on the strategic policy committees. So there is a structure that's there, but it needs to be resourced and it needs to be taken seriously right now you know, all power is with the chief executive and his board of directors. And it doesn't matter what you think, doesn't matter where you're from, whether you're from the county or from the city, the, the board of management and the council has complete total, it is a complete total dictatorship as, of, as, it's, as things stand. I'm only, I'm only going in there to say what needs to be said, quite frankly, because there's a lot of political correctness that goes on. Oh, you can't say this, you can't say that. Look around us, do you know what I mean? We've got housing crisis, health crisis, you name it, we have a crisis. And I think above all of the crises that we face now in Ireland, there's one crisis that needs to be addressed, and that's the government crisis. Because our government is not in control. Our elected councillors are not in control. Our ministers are not in control. The civil service is in control. And who is the civil service? Sure, nobody even knows them. So I'm trying to bring the civil service into view you and give jobs. powers back to the communities. We we'll have some jobs into control the civil service because, as we all know, they are not the departments. People think that the ministers go up and make these decisions. They don't. Yeah, yeah, most yeah. decisions come, as we know, from the civil service. But what would you do about housing in the city, for example? What do you think should be done about housing? <sighs> well, there. if you walk through Limerick City, anyone can see for their own eyes there are hundreds if not thousands of vacant residential units all across the city and county, in the towns, in the villages, and in the inner city, and even in the suburbs as well. Even I heard stories of council housing, newly refurbished council housing boarded up, vacant, going derelict. Why? We already have houses with roofs over them and boarded up windows. Why is that? And the government is kind of fascinated on building new bills but if you ask anyone in the construction industry about the price of materials price of materials with covid have doubled um, labor costs have doubled there's a shortage of labor there's a shortage of supply so why is why is our government building new houses from scratch when we have thousands of empty vacant houses falling into dereliction in right beside me here. I live next to the Abbey river, just by the absolute hotel. There are five houses on long lane, all boarded up. Why? Why is that? They've been like that for the last 15 years. 
Do you know what I mean? So I'm starting to question, is this council, are they either incompetent or are they actually are they actually just trying to destroy our county? Because the solutions are there. You go into a taxi cab, the taxi man will tell you what needs to be done. It's not rocket science, but there's something wrong with the council that we have this chief executive who has complete arrogant attitude, does not engage in the public. You never see him walking, talking to the local businesses, engaging with the communities. You never see him on the ground. He's just out and playing golf or he's in the office and he's a, his own chauffeur service. So this is what we have in Limerick. And that's why we have so many problems with housing, healthcare, all across the board. The solutions are there. The resources are there. Limerick is great people, great communities. But unless the council is on board, then we're going nowhere. So that's why it's so important that the power is actually taken from the executive who are unelected and given back to the communities and the people. Because I'm not going to stand here and tell you what the, hosp the regional hospital needs. The nurses will tell you themselves, you know, and in terms of housing, I think we should take a balanced approach, go to the tenants, ask the tenants, what are the issues, go to the landlords, ask the landlords how we can um, offer more housing, how we can bring more housing on stream. They'll tell you it's, they're up to their eyeballs and regulations. They can't install a doorknob without some regulation coming down on the back of them. So we need to actually make it easier for people to renovate houses and bring them back on stream. And we need to um, we need to just have a common sense approach to this. No political, we can't let politics get in the way because we have- Those, those you see all the time. It's like houses there. I mean, the, 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 the obvious thing is to get your name in the housing list. And the old system was, if you were a council who could kind of go in and, and pull a few strings and get you a house, I mean, that that, that is wrong. But then that gets back to par parish, what do they call it? Parish, parish pump, pump politics. And it does, because I mean, you heard and I've heard over the years that, that such a one got a house, the councillor was able to get this house for, which is wrong. And then there was ah, the whole system to badly need to be changed, you know. Yeah, it needs but, to be transparent, it needs to be straightforward, it needs yeah, to make it, sense. It, it if if you've been on the housing list for seven years, yeah. then why is someone who's been on the housing list for two years getting the house ahead of you? Do you know what I mean? It's unfair. It's unfair. It's completely yeah, unfair, unfair, completely unjust. And at but, this stage of the game, you know, I'm sick of hearing what Mary Lou MacDonald said to Hall Martin or what Leo Radker said, because to be honest, none of that matters. I'm only interested in the civil service. That's the only people I'm interested in. And when I ever refer to our government, I'm not referring to our county councillors, nor am I referring to our TDs. I'm referring specifically to the civil service, Pat Daly, Con Murray, these are the guys who need to be under scrutiny, not our councillors. Because at the end of the day, those councillors who might get you onto the housing list or get you a, so, a public social house, they can't do that unless they ring Aoife Duke, who is the head of housing, and then she'll have to get that passed by the chief executive to sign it off. So, you know, you can go to your councillor, but unless they have clout with the executive board, then, you know, they have no chance, which is why the councillors are very, very slow to criticize the executive because if they ever criticize the executive, they will never get another favor. And that's how they gain their control over the whole councillors. I've, uh, I've been to lots and lots of council meetings and uh, to see the carry on, I sort of know it's, it's, it's embarrassing, you know. Yeah. As regards, I remember last year being outside in the city hall, in, in the council, in the, in the county, when they were giving out these um, these appointments to various boards and that. And I was watching it all, what was going on. It was unreal, you know. I'd say they were like licking their lips. I have this. If you get a bonus. If you're sitting on a committee, let's yeah. say you're on the board of, yeah. let's say you're a county councillor and you get selected onto the board of Limerick 2030 yeah. because Con Murray has a fancy for you. Well, then you get a bonus. Con Murray is gone. No, he's now the chair of Limerick 2030. Oh, 2030, oh yeah. Yeah. So um, he's very clever. He's a clever man. I'll give him that. He's a clever this, man. This, this 2030, you wonder like what? The fixation, it was 2020 before, wasn't it? And then, you know, the, the, this fixation with 2030. Why, I don't know. You know, anyway, that's beside the point. But like that, I don't know. It's going to be very difficult. 
you know, that if you're elected mayor, how you, I don't really, it's going to be very hard to get involved, you know. Oh, no, I don't think it's hard at all because think about it. If you, anybody, was elected on behalf of not only the people of Limerick City, but the people of Limerick City and County, mm-hmm. that's a massive mandate. Because think about it old fashioned. If someone puts their belief in you, if they vote for you, if they go out to the ballot box and they put a number one next to your name, that's a massive vote of approval. They want you to represent them. How many votes does Con Murray have? How many votes does Pat Daly have? Who elected them? What power do they have? Do you know what I mean? They don't have any power. So actually, they're straw men. Do you know, they're, they're sitting on top of a house of cards. If the people of Limerick City and County can actually come together and say, do you know what? We deserve better. And we actually have had enough of this political pantomime. We just want our basic needs looked after. We pay enough taxes. We pay enough rates. Will you just please start looking after the people of this county who've grown up here, lived here for several generations. Their children are going up here. We've had enough of this council and all the bull that goes along with it. So I, that's why I'm putting myself forward because I have my own business to look after. I, you know, I live in Limerick. I'm going to hopefully settle down here, get married here, have my own kids. And I'm looking ahead. I'm looking into my future. And I'm just thinking I could work my elbow off to develop my business. But if I'm suffering under the mismanagement of our county, then I'm really going nowhere. So it's my priority, not only for my good, uh, for my own interests, but for the interests of my community and the county, which I care a lot about, is uh, to go into the council and just say what needs to be said. Because at the moment, it's this kind of whole politically correct kind of bubble. And we just need common sense and we need honesty and we need to be frank and we need to be direct because we don't have the time to be messing with political um, fluff. So will party politics get into this, you see? That's what I'm afraid of. You know, will, will you get uh, some fellow that's nominated by Fianna Fáil? Will the Labour Party have somebody? Will Fianna Gael? Uh, will Sinn Féin? If they have all these people going in, they're going to side with their own party. You know, that's, that, that's only human nature, which are, which are people looking for appointments and looking for various things. It's like, like the appointments of uh, uh, usually people that are appointed to um, to what used to be the George Justice of the Peace. What do they call them now? They've uh, fellow that signs the summonses. Uh, you get these fellows who have always been proselytizers for various um, uh, uh, parties, political parties. It's a kind of a, an award they get for going around canvassing. So you're going to get these people that are going to um, be involved in, in, in the mayoralty. That's what I dread. Well, I think it's inevitable um, because at the end of the day, we do have a multi-party political system. But, you know, I'm going in as an... If not for this, I didn't think this was got to do with party politics at all. No, I think that each party will put forward their own candidates. And I... uh, That's fine fine by me. I'm only interested in myself and my community and my, my own campaign. So I'm running as an independent because I think that politics actually gets in the way of public service how can you serve the common good when you're have to vote with your party and you can't say how you feel but that will happen again if 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 you know, fall upon somebody to run to be mayor surely to god he's got to side with them then if it comes up to any any voting uh, with the city council he'll vote for Fianna Fáil. well all i can say is my party is limerick but there is no limerick party yet so I'm just going to run as an independent and see how I get on. As of now, I'm the only person in the race. Yeah. There, because I don't know why they're all afraid of this because they, there's so much uncertainty. I would never run as a county councillor, nor would I ever run for the general election as a TD because they don't have any power. This is the first time that there's real um, executive powers being offered and this direct elected mayor. So this is no joke. This is the real deal. But unless the people of Limerick are on board, they're going to try and stall the ball, put it off, and eventually they're going to call the hot, they're going to call the whole thing off and it'll never happen. So that's why I'm on here, not only to promote my campaign, but to promote the directly elected mayor to the people who are watching, because we cannot miss this opportunity. This is 
this is what we've been waiting for. This is it. Well, it is. It's fantastic, to, I suppose, an opportunity that we have to elect somebody that's an at a political appointee, really, and somebody that would have an interest in the city and would know what's going on and would know the city, you know, to know where houses should be built and uh, where how, if houses could be renovated uh, and the allocation of houses as well is very important, I think. But uh, it hasn't been for years and years, but it's a pity it's not. I should ask you, Kevin, are you a shop? I should say it as well, I'm doing the market. Yeah, so my shop is called Restory and I just opened it there last Christmas. Uh, I make um, furniture like chairs, coffee tables. Like I did a, an apprenticeship with a carpenter after I got my degree in UL. I decided I'd do an apprenticeship with a carpenter. Sounds strange, but I actually enjoy working with my hands. And uh, although UL was fantastic, you only are taught you know, soft skills. You're not actually given any real world, you know, manual yeah. hand skills. And I feel like we're a society of overeducated and underskilled. So I wanted to balance my education with the skills. And I was able to put the two together and open a business making handmade furniture here in Limerick and also selling art from local artists and various other products from new and established businesses. So that's what I do. You're in the milk market. And in the milk many, market. And how many next, days you open there? What way do you work? Shop hours? I open Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. And my father is next door to me. He's in the clothes shop called The Edge. So he sells secondhand vintage clothes. Yeah. And he's been trading in Limerick since 1983. So I only started in 2020. Um, but people were telling me, oh, you're crazy to be opening a business in the middle of a pandemic. But I said, it's actually, if you look back into history, it's the times of the Great Depression or the World Wars. That's when new opportunities seem to pop up. And now with Brexit and COVID and everything, there's lots of challenges, but there's also an equal amount, if not more, opportunities for businesses if people are just willing to look on the bright side and pick themselves up and say, actually, um, what can we do here um, to make a few bob? And I've profited off the fact that more people now are giving their support to local businesses. So people are looking for stuff that's made in Limerick because, you know, you can't find things that are made in Limerick anymore. Everything's made in who knows yeah. where. Well, I know it. Uh, but like your, your unit now in the market, who owns that unit? Is that the corporation property? Well, the Earl of Limerick was given out uh, 999 year leases there a few years ago. And my father got in on that. So you'll have to ask Mr. Perry. <laughs> oh, yeah. The living in London. Uh, why, have you there, why have you that notice up behind you there? You know, the Atenaeum building behind you there. The Limerick Atenaeum, uh, established in 1853. Why have you that sign up there? Well, I made that sign... Um, last year before COVID because myself and a few friends had a plan to relaunch the Ath Athenaeum or Athenaeum. So you may be aware of it, but uh, your viewers, if they haven't heard of the Limerick Athenaeum, just do a Google search and it's all there on Wikipedia. So it's still, the building actually still stands on Cecil street, I think it is. And there was, it's, 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 it's such a really, it's a cultural landmark and it's so sad to see it sitting idle for so many years. So our idea was if we relaunched the Athenaeum, let's say in Ma Hogan's bar, in the back of a bar, start off small, a few people just giving debates, lectures or talk, telling stories, whatever it is, get it started and then maybe we can build it up so that we can actually take back the Limerick Athenian building and get funding down the line. So people might have heard of Catherine Hayes, the opera singer. She sang there. Um, mm -hmm. Who else is there? Podrick Pierce, Roger Casement, Michael Cusack, the founder of the GAA, um, Oscar Wilde, Maud Gahn, even Harry Houdini apparently played in the Limerick Athenian. So it's so much history. There is a book. Uh, it was the first book ever to go on the internet, actually. A book written by James McMahon. 
and James did a fabulous book on Vietnam uh, with, with help from Seamus Flynn, who owned it at the time. And uh, well, most people now would know that building as the Royal Cinema. Anybody from Limerick is watching us because they're wondering where it is. It's uh, it's now the, the it was the Royal Cinema. And next door to it, you had um, you had what was known you have the VC offices are next door. And I went I went to school there, believe it or not. That was the what's known before your time as the one day school. I had to go to school one day a week till you were 16. And I went to school there because I was working at 14. And you had to go to school one day a week. But that was the building next door up the steps yeah. that the VC have now. But that was all part of the Ateneum. And uh, it's anybody want, uh, you can access it as you said on Wikipedia or on the internet. Just put in uh, Ateneum and James McMahon's book. It's a fabulous book, very big book that James did on the Ateneum. And the people, all the people that played there over the years. And uh, it was used in uh, uh, an episode of Father Ted uh, where they have this. My lovely horse. Yeah, my lovely horse, exactly. And uh, you can see, you get a glimpse into it at the time. Yeah. Say in the building, you know, but like that anyway. It's um, it's an old Limerick, uh, what I say, building that's it's in a sad state now, you know. And I remember going to many, many a picture there in the in which was the cinema. I used to go there an awful lot, you know. They even ran midnight pictures that didn't start at night till uh, till 12 o'clock. They were hilarious, anyway. That's a story for another day. We're moving away slightly from the the, the melody, anyway. You know, and, um, I, I don't know what to say to you um, about about the the the, 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 the melody itself. I suppose um, I just hope that you're successful. And there's um, we'll have to wait and see. Is there any time that I suppose you didn't hear anything about when they're going to have voting or anything? You didn't hear anything from them. Well, 2022, and sometime in the first quarter of 2022, so like spring 2022 is what they're saying, but it's anyone's guess. And the way things are going, I think it's going to be pushed back to summer 2022. Then it'll be pushed back to winter 2022 until eventually they'll be able to scrap the whole thing. And that's why I'm actually concerned, not for my campaign, but for the actual direct elected mayor to even happen. But I think what people need to realize is rather than throwing in the hat and saying, oh, this is hopeless, it'll never happen. The people of Limerick have to realize that actually we voted for it. This is our county. They're using our taxes and our rates. You know, it's not their government. It's our government. It's not their country. It's our country. Think about it. This is 100 years since we got our independence. And like our government, as we speak, is allowing these foreign investment funds to come in and buy up family homes. What kind of... What kind of sovereign government does that? What kind of sovereign government lets people wait on trolleys in corridors? What kind of sovereign government, you know, um, you can go on and on. The list is just crazy. So I think something needs to be done. And that's why this direct elected mayor is so important because this is the chink in the armor that will allow the people to actually get back some of their powers that have been taken away from them over the years by these governments, which have slowly but surely taking powers away from people without us even knowing really you know so this is a big moment uh, for Limerick I, I really hope you're successful you know and that, that there's something done and that this the only thing you should have to keep on to them to find out when is this going to happen people and if they're interested they can ask the, the only ones they can ask are the local councillors uh, even people in the county there's there are these councillors out there who have been well paid and the people don't even realise that I suppose you know that they are right. and expenses, of course, have on top of that. But like that, um, if people get onto the councillors or even write to the city hall, which would be the best thing, and ask uh, ask the chief executive what is happening. You know, that, um, is this mayor going to go ahead? Well, it's not their choice; it's our choice. If this mayor yeah. is going to go ahead, it's actually up to us to start talking about it, make noise, um, you know, just. Whatever it is, if someone is really interested in this direct elected mayor, they can actually contact me on my website, Restory. I have my number, my email, everything is up there. Um, and they can reach out. Whether they like me or not, let's just all be on board that this direct What is that website again to get you on? My, my store? It's www 
restory.ie so r e s t o r y .ie story yeah. and uh, all my details are up on there and if if you're not good with the internet call into me in the milk market friday saturday sunday morning and uh, and let's let's do something about this you know you're going to get some kind of a petition going as well when in the market you know just to see would people even, even sign a petition, you know? And then are these, the only thing I, I'm afraid of is that there are people that are not from the city, would they be uh, from the city or the county? Are they interested even in the mayor for Limerick? You well, know? we voted yes. Um, it was only a margin of four or 5,000 votes, but it's still, you know, it's still a majority vote. And I think that if people knew how much of an, an amazing opportunity this is for their community, whether you're in Abbeyfield or Castle Connell, doesn't matter. This is a massive opportunity for us to actually take back power from the unelected civil service and give it to someone who will be rep elected to represent the constituents, yeah. not only of Limerick City, but of the county, the whole place. And I'm not going to go in there like a dictator because everyone will know my face. They'll know my name. I won't be able to turn around and break a promise to you or anyone else because you'll be able to go up to me in the street and tell me exactly how you feel so that's real accountability as of now the chief executive can walk around town and nobody even recognizes him and he has complete control and complete anonymity exempt from any form of accountability on big wage big salary so i'm just there to bring people's um, powers back uh, to them from the unelected to the elected democracy, because this, we need to be a republic, not only in name, but in principle as well. So let's uh, let's get together and and do something. And I'm, can I thank you for coming on this program? And uh, I hope it is you're successful and we'll have to wait and see what happens. And I suppose get the word out that the people that they should do something about it and try and get, get the thing over with as soon as possible. Get what I mean, get it over, get some kind of a date and some kind of a time scale on it. Because as we, at the moment, people don't even know what's happening, which is, yeah. I don't know. The, 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 I'd say if we were to do a kind of a survey in the market, would people, would they sign a petition first of all? And if they did, at least you'd know if they knew about the thing. You know? Well, I'm going to have to drum up some publicity. So I've got a, a, a guy over from America and he actually ran across the USA from Atlantic coast to the Pacific coast coast to coast like you're standing there in the background behind you he did that across the usa three times and he also ran from cork to donegal through limerick and donegal to galway galway to dublin so he's well known he's he's kind of uh, his name is noah cochlin so he's same surname as me and he's here to trace his family tree but yeah. we're going to run together from abbey field over to castle connell and we're going to stop off on each town and along the way literally they, letting them know that this direct elected mayor is happening just yeah. to drop a bit of, you know, a bit of get things moving, you know. So yeah. keep an eye out for that. That'd be something anyway. Is he, where is he from? He's from America, is he? Well, his grandfather left Bantry in 1907. Yeah. And he just arrived back in Ireland now to try and uh, trace his family tree. And uh, he actually wants to start a new life here in Ireland. And he's not the first American who's actually been moving back. Quite a yeah. few Americans have started moving back to Ireland, and I think it's fantastic. Yeah. You know? So hopefully that will continue. Well, you better apply for a voting card if he's going to vote for you. Better, better organise something that he'd ever, he'd ever vote in the country. There's no good morning that, yeah. the vote. Well, he has a passport, so he, he might yeah. be eligible. But thanks, Tony. I really appreciate the... Okay, everyone. We'll talk you. again. And if thanks. anybody wants to see you, they can call into the market anyway. Do. Call down. Say hello. Take care now. All the best. Good luck, Joe.